So, uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name's Isaac, and after Haley's excellent talk, we're going to move more into the realm of uh, software engineering and security. Now, this is actually the second time I've delivered this talk, um, or this is the second time I've delivered uh, a different version of this talk, because the first time I did this was at my internship over the summer. Uh, over the summer, I was at a company called Netcraft, which some of you might have heard of. Um, and while I was there, I was working uh, on, I worked on a few things, and one of the things I worked on, or worked against, should I say, is Flubot, which is a piece of Android malware. Um, and I delivered this talk to some uh, prize-winning first years from some other universities um, around Bath, so Bath and Bristol and Southampton. So has anybody heard of Flubot before? Okay, I, I, that is sort of what I was expecting. Has anyone had a text message within the last year or so about picking up a parcel or about a voicemail or something like that? Yeah. So that was most likely Flubot or some derivative thereof. Just out of interest, did any of you uh, follow the instructions in that text message? <laughs> right, well, that's reassuring. So Flubot is some Android malware, and its core purpose is to steal your banking details and hence steal your money. And it does this through a fairly common um, Android um, attack called an overlay attack, whereby a fake login screen is displayed over the top of um, a, 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 a real app. Um, and you enter your details into that fake login screen, and then they get sent off to, to some database somewhere. Um, as some of you have had, uh, have seen with first-hand experience, it, it spreads via text messages. And it first appeared in Spain in early 2021, or maybe late 2020. But now countries across Europe have been affected by it, uh, and towards Australia and New Zealand more recently as well. And so in this talk, we're going to look at how Flubot spreads, the um, fairly sophisticated, in some cases, uh, countermeasures it has against um, basic defenses, uh, and also the overlay attack itself. So, how does it all begin? Well, with text messages like this, where we have, um, from some unknown sender, some text message about a delivery with a link that looks completely unrelated to any form of delivery service. Uh, or, more recently, um, they are purporting to be a message about a security update. So you click on that link, and you're taken to a site like this. This is called a Lure site. Uh, and this site will contain something, a page, something like this. It will host an APK, which is an Android um, app package, essentially. And there'll also be some limited form of administration for the malware operators to update the pages. So here's one you might find, a UPS one. There'll be FedEx ones, other things like that. Um, or my personal favorite, which is one that prompts you to update your, your device to protect you against uh, Flubot itself. So very thoughtful there. Um, interestingly, a lot of these sites are actually other people's websites, and that explains why they seem unrelated. Um, and many of them um, are WordPress sites. And due to the large number of word, shoddily written WordPress plugins, there are a large number of exploits in, 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 a, in a lot of websites um, which are used for um, lure sites like this. So you've clicked the link. You've obeyed the command, and it's all downhill from here. You downloaded the app, and the first thing it does is it works out where you are. And it does this so it can tailor, its ex tailor your experience. And it will first you know, make sure it's using the right language to, to, to speak to you. And it will also uh, set your country code so that when your phone sends out other text messages to other people, they're going to people in your country. And on the left, we can see some of the code that's used to, to, to configure some of this. And you can see some of the, um, the country codes there. We've got Finland, we've got some Spanish ones, we've got uh, Denmark and Sweden and England, and there are other ones as well. But on the right, interestingly, you can see some which are skipped. And if any of you are familiar with these uh, language country codes, uh, you'll see that most of them are from the Soviet Union. And so uh, no prizes for guessing where this malware came from. Then, very politely, 
Fluebot will ask for permission to do certain things. Now, Android and I, I believe iOS as well have um, in their security model um, a system where you have to ask for, uh, where an app has to ask for permissions to do certain things which might pose a security risk. Um, and so Fluebot has to go through this process as well. And we can see uh, in the purple on the right there, we have uh, that it has to ask for permission to use the internet. Um, in the sort of violet -y color towards the top, we have read contacts and send SMS. Um, and these are needed for it to spread. And uh, in blue at the top, we have query all packages, which is needed for Fluebot to work out which banking apps it is targeting, which banking apps there are these overlays, these fake login screens for. And then these other two which I've highlighted in turquoise may seem a bit unusual. Why do we need to ignore battery optimizations and what, what's accessibility about? Well, first of all, accessibility binding to the accessibility service is very, very powerful. It allows Fluebot to do a wide range of things. So one thing it, can, it lets it do is it lets it disable Play Protect, which is Android's um, essentially built-in um, malware scanner. It also prevents uninstallation of Fluebot. Um, and perhaps most importantly, um, most core to Fluebot's um, being is that it lets Fluebot display an overlay, display a fake login screen when a targeted banking app is opened. And then one other thing it lets it do quite conveniently is it lets it automatically approve some other permissions, some of which we've seen, but also including this request ignore battery optimizations. And this is also crucial because it means Fluebot can run in the background. Now, most mobile phones, in fact, well, pretty much all mobile phones, when, when, you, um, when you're not using an app, that app, when it's in the background, will be suspended. Um, and it does this in order to save battery because battery technology lags behind every other. Um, but, of course, there are some apps which need to run in the background. So, for example, your music player, when you switch over from your music player to your email, you want the music to keep playing. And another type which, which wants to run in the background is Fluebot. Um, and there, there are other techniques of doing this, but Fluebot does it by ignoring battery optimizations. And it wants to run in the background because that's where it does all of its, uh, all of its work. That's where it's sitting, listening, waiting for you to open a banking app. It's where it's uh, waiting for commands from uh, control servers. And it's where it's sending out text messages to other people. So just a, um, a note about the app itself and some of the, the, the defenses which the malware authors put into the code itself. So some of you might be familiar with, with Android application development. Android apps uh, are written in Java or Kotlin typically. Um, and so you'd be forgiven for thinking that they run on the Java virtual machine. However, that, that is not the case. Um, they're compiled not to Java bytecode, but to um, a kind of bytecode called Dalvik bytecode. And this used to be run on the uh, Dalvik virtual machine, uh, although now it's run, uh, it's compiled natively at installation time. But a, a common technique um, with, with uh, Android apps is to use what's called a packer. And this um, essentially encrypts the bytecode until runtime, until the, the app is loaded. And this, this can be done not just for bytecode, but for other resources as well, uh, for non-nefarious purposes, if you want to protect intellectual property. However, a lot of malware also uses packers because it means it's harder to perform static analysis on, uh, on, on, uh, on, on the uh, application's bytecode. Um, so uh, only at runtime will the bytecode be loaded. And we can get around this by using um, uh, dynamic hooks, runtime hooks, um, which are hooks that you insert into the code to call certain um, other bits of code um, that we would have written. Um, and so th there is a way around this, but it's just a bit inconvenient, really. And uh, one of the th um, thing they do to, to make static analysis more difficult is obfuscation of strings and identifiers. So instead of having string literals such as preping here, which is a command, um, which would be commonly be used by Flubot. You'll end up with something that if you decompiled it, look a bit, looked a bit more like this other code here, where we have 
the dollar sign, which is actually a legal function name in Java, uh, and then three arguments. And these are parameters to a custom um, script string obfuscation function, which performs a, a, a kind of transformation from a, a list of characters into the original string. And so again, we can get around this with runtime hooks, but it just adds an, an extra layer of inconvenience for security researchers. So once the, the app has set itself up and got itself going, it's, it wants to phone home. It wants to connect back to a C2 server. A C2 server is a command and control server. And as the name suggests, this is where the malware operators can control the malware. And it's also where stolen credentials will be sent back to. Um, and what we see on the screen here is actually a, uh, a screenshot of the control panel of Flubot, at least at one iteration. Um, I'm not entirely sure how this was, um, how this was extracted, um, but I found this on this PDF here. And so you can see here, this table, each row is a, uh, a compromised device. And uh, at the far right, you can see some buttons there. We have command, log, and uh, logs and status. And so we can send some commands to the infected devices. We can, inset, uh, we can send a number of these, which we'll see later on. And then also, you, there's, there's a bunch of other things. There's aggregate statistics, just as we see here, and logs and other things like that. So. How does Flubot actually connect to the C2 server? Well, you could have a hard-coded domain name. You could just put the domain name in the code. Um, but obviously, the problem there is once the security researchers have got round to um, de-obfuscating the, the strings, they can just perform some kind of takedown procedure against, um, against that C2 server. And once it's gone, you have to do a full update of the client to point to your new C2 server. Oh, you could hard code a list, but this has a similar kind of problem. They're both quite fragile solutions. So what some malware does is it uses a DGA, a domain generation algorithm. Um, CryptoLocker, if anyone remembers that, that used a DGA, and Flubot likewise. So this is a, a pseudo-random algorithm. It generates a list of, um, of domain names, um, and the operators will, will run this as well, and they will choose some domain names from that and register those. And when the client wants to connect to a C2 server, it will run that, uh, run that DGA itself and keep trying until it finds a domain, that, that, uh, domain name that works. Um, and so this is much less fragile as this can be uh, run as long as we need if we need to get generate new domains. Now, as researchers, there is a, there is a countermeasure to this, a common countermeasure called sinkholing, where if you can work out how the DGA works, you can run it yourself. And then you choose some domain names from that, ideally high up in the list so that they, they're the ones that the clients would choose first. And then you register them as your own domain names, point them to your own server, and then do whatever you want, such as logging connections for investigation, or, or even just completely neutralizing the effect of the malware by pretending you're the C2 server and not responding to anything. Um, however, Flubot has a couple of countermeasures against this, one of which is just to choose randomly so that you know, choosing a sinkhole is less likely. But the more important one is that client-server um, communication is actually encrypted using a, a custom public key um, scheme. And we'll look at that in more detail in a, in a little while, but essentially what it means is that the client can distinguish between a real C2 server and a sinkhole because the sinkhole won't know the correct private key. And what this boils down to is that the client will just be able to skip straight over sinkholes. So this very, very useful countermeasure uh, is completely useless against Flubot. So Flubot, its client has now got a, a domain name for a C2 server and it wants to connect to that C2 server. Now, what, would you, what, what the straightforward approach would be would be to use DNS to resolve this domain name into an IP address and then to connect to that IP address. And this is what Flubot used to do, um, and it works pretty well. However, 
uh, in more recent versions, this has changed to use a technique called DNS tunneling. So the C2 server it is set up as a name server itself, so as a server which will take requests to resolve domain names and turn them back into our IP addresses. And so client to server communication will be sent as DNS queries and server to client um, responses will come back as TXT fields, TXT records. And the benefit of doing this is that DNS is such a common protocol and it's so crucial to the functioning of the internet that most firewalls are set up to simply let it through. So by tunneling your data through DNS, you can generally avoid any um, uh, or many firewalls. Now, moving on to the, the application layer protocol within, um, within Flubot, the general operation is like this. The client will, issue all, um, will initiate all communication. The client makes a request and the server responds. So if the server wants to command the client to do something, it will queue up some commands. It will queue up some commands and the client will request those outstanding commands. Now the client can also send information to the server using this log command. And there are a bunch of other commands that the client can send to the server. Uh, messages are typically base64 encoded, then munged a bit, and then base32 encoded. Uh, and they're also split into numbered chunks for, to fit within DNS, and then they're reassembled at the other end. Now, here's some of the other commands that we, that we have. Uh, within for ones that the client can send to the server on the left there, so we saw ping and log on the previous slide, and there are some other ones, such as get inject and get inject list, which are used to download the, the overlays, the fake login screens. Um, and the commands that the server can send to the client uh, are in the table on the right, and there's, there's a number of these. There's a large amount of functionality within Flubot, and uh, we, we'll see some of these commands come up over the next few slides. Now, I mentioned when we were looking at the DGA that a, a custom encryption um, scheme is used for Flubot, and it looks something like this. It's a mixture of asymmetric and symmetric cryptography. So, when the client wants to make a request, um, some of it is encrypted uh, asymmetrically and some of it is uh, encrypted symmetrically. The bit that is encrypted asymmetrically is the UUID and the symmetric key. So the UUID is a unique identifier for the client. And the symmetric key is a key that the client chooses to, for the symmetric encryption um, communication between the client and the server. So K prime is the symmetric key. KC2 is the uh, C2 server's public key. And so we encrypt the UUID and the symmetric key with the public key, and then encrypt the request with the symmetric key. These are all basics 64 encoded, munged a bit, base32 encoded, and sent to the server. The server decrypts them. It decrypts the UUID and the symmetric key um, using its private key, and then uses the symmetric key to decrypt the request. And once it's got the request, it does whatever it needs to do, generates a response, and sends that back. And that is sent back encrypted just with the symmetric key. Um, but as well as sending back the response, it will also send back the UUID it received. And this is used as proof when the client decrypts it um, that the C2 server was in fact a C2 server. And this works because it is proof that the server knew the private key. And this is how Flubot can just skip straight over those sinkholes. So if the UUIDs don't match on any request, it will, the client will detach itself from that server and move on to the next server from the DGA. Otherwise, it will continue as normal. And so with all that in place, we can see what Flubot actually does, how it spreads, and how it steals your details. Now, I mentioned uh, how clients attach to servers, and this is the vague, a general sort of process that they go through. Now, this may differ um, in different versions of Flubot, but this is a pretty representative um, sort of pattern of communications. So they'll a client will initially register itself using the pre-ping command, and this just alerts the server that the client uh, it, it is wanting to attach itself to it. And then the client will issue this get injects list command. 
Now, injects is, that's the Flubot terminology for overlays, for the fake login screens that will be displayed over the banking app. And the client will send this get injects list command with a list of packages. And these packages are um, correspond to each app on the phone. And the server will respond with a subset of those for which there exist overlays. So essentially, the server will send back all of the banking apps on the phone. And then once the, server, once the client has received that list, it will loop through each, uh, each app and request the overlay for it. And the overlays are actually just web pages. So the client will send for each banking app uh, package name it gets back, it will send get inject that package name and get back a web page. And then some other things might happen. So the server might ask for the contacts. Um, and well, in fact, the server will ask, ask for the contacts at some point. Um, and it may also tell the, tell the client that it should disable play protect, or there's a number of other things it might wish to do. So that's registration. That's how the, the client um, alerts the server to its presence and sets up the connection to begin with. Now, how does Flubot spread? Well, we, we saw some of this uh, on the previous slide. When the client first connects to the server, the server will request the contacts list from that, from that device. That phone will respond with its contacts list, and those contacts will get distributed to other phones because um, you don't want to be sending messages about parcel deliveries from your own phone to your mum because she's probably going to see through it. So once the server knows the contacts list, it will, the client will then ask for the SMS rate, which is the rate at which it should send text messages out. And the server will respond with, a, um, with a, a number, N, which represents the number of seconds between text messages. And then the client will also repeatedly tell the server if it's the default um, text application. And then with knowledge of how frequently it should send out these text messages, it will do, every, every N seconds, it will ask the server for a text message and a number to send that message to. The server will oblige, sending back a number and a message, and the client will simply send that message to that number, and then it will block that number on the phone so that the recipient can't then tech reply to that number and ask, is this real, is this a scam? Um, and this brings us to the, the, the meat of the app, the raison d'etre of Flubot, which is the overlays. Now, on the screen here are some uh, example overlays for banking apps. And these are actually generated by some code I wrote to automate uh, fetching and, um, and screenshotting these apps, uh, these overlays, um, by simulating a, an infected device. Um, this one uh, on the front there is for a German bank called Sparkasse. This one might be familiar to some of you if you use Halifax. And you can see, actually, that this is quite realistic. It's quite, it's quite well put together. And this last one is not a banking app, per se, but uh, WhatsApp could plausibly, in, in some people's minds, ask you for age verification. And so the malware authors uh, included this overlay, where you verify your age using your card details. And so how this all works, well, we saw some of this on uh, a couple of slides ago. When the client registers itself with the server, it will ask for all of the injects from the, uh, for the apps on that phone. And then once it's downloaded all of them as web pages, it will just, Flubot will just sit in the background waiting for you to open a targeted app. And when you open um, a banking app, um, it will detect that and it will, instead of showing your banking app, it will show its fake one in a web view over the top. You enter your details into there. They get sent back to the server with a log, uh, log command. And within the next couple of days, you can expect your account to be siphoned of money. And we actually have a video here of this, this in action. Now, this, ran in, this is running in an emulator. And you'll see the DHL app. That is actually Flubot. And in the top, we have blockchain. This is the targeted app. The real login screen pops up for a second, but if you're not paying attention, it's quickly replaced with the fake one. And this was quite an early overlay, so you can see the quality here is a, a little worse than some of the ones we saw on the previous slide. 
But if you're not paying attention, if you're not technologically, uh, you know, if you're not so familiar with these things, you might plausibly be tricked by this. And so that is the main purpose of Flubot. That's what Flubot will, um, aims to do um, in general. But there are some other features which it includes. For example, this fake Google Play verification page, this, is, uh, this can be popped up at any time on the user's phone. If some of you have Androids, occasionally I've noticed Google Play will prompt you for something, and this is what that seeks to emulate. You enter your card details, same thing happens as with any of the other overlays. Another feature is um, that the, using this SOX command, the uh, malware operators can establish a connection and a connection for arbitrary communication with between the server and the client at any point. And then another feature is that Flubot can intercept your text messages that are incoming and it can upload them to the server. Um, and Flubot also has the capability to block uh, notifications or to dismiss notifications. And so what it can do is it can see incoming text messages about Flubot, say you've been alerted by your bank about Flubot, and it can delete them. Um, and then one final thing, which I thought was interesting that it could do, is it can run these things called USSD codes. Now, USSD codes are short commands uh, which can be sent to your telcos, your, your mobile networks servers. Um, and these, these vary from, the, the exact definitions vary from telco to telco, um, but these can be used for a wide variety of things, such as checking if you've got a pay-as-you-go phone, you can check your balance with that, you can um, get uh, very basic um, information um, downloads. So, for example, Wikipedia actually have a, a USSD-based service where you can text a number and get Wikipedia pages. Um, but one, probably the thing which was most, most attractive to the Flubot authors was the ability to pay through your phone. So you may have noticed there are some parking meters in certain places, for example, where you can pay by texting a certain number. Um, and of course, this extends to paying the Flubot operators without your consent. So that's all, you know, that, 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 that's a large amount of stuff that Flubot can do. So what can we do to defend against that? Well, it's fairly, there's a fairly limited range of defenses against this. Most of them focus on prevention, stopping people getting to the point where they have Flubot installed. So if you have a company phone, they may manage it. They may, they may be able to restrict the downloads just to App Store downloads, because by default, Android will let you download apps from unknown locations, as is Flubot. Um, however, this only applies to company phones. This doesn't apply to your phone. Um, and so this is only a limited form of defense. Um, another form of defense is being able to block connections to lure sites. And this is one thing that Netcraft can help with. Most major browsers have um, used Net Netcraft's feeds of malicious URLs to automatically block um, or, or warn you when you're accessing a malicious site. So if, if, if Netcraft has the lure site URL in their feeds, um, or other companies um, which provide feeds to the browsers, then the browser will block that URL. However, this is a, this is a game of catch up, really. The lure site will exist for some time before getting put into one of these feeds. And so, again, this, this technique is not perfect. You can also block C2 connections on, a DNS, uh, on the level of DNS. And so, within a, an organization, if they want to defend all of their devices, uh, all the devices on their network against it, they can. Um, block any connections to C2 servers. And that also applies to the lure sites, although there's a lot more of those lure sites. Some telcos are filtering outbound text messages so they can detect when a, a text message seems um, suspicious and prevent that from reaching its target. But again, this isn't perfect. Now, one thing you might think is that, well, banking apps are increasingly using two-factor authentication or biometric logins. Now, 
biometric logins are better than two-factor authentication in this case because two-factor authentication, um, Flubot, I don't know whether it does or not, but it certainly has the capability to read parts of the screen. And so it could read your, um, your six-digit code from your authenticator app. But perhaps more importantly here is the fact that even with two-factor authentication or biometric logins, if someone is prompted with a username and password, they're just going to enter their details. They'll just think, oh, the app's being funny, I've got to enter my details. So no matter whether you've got these, these, these other forms of login, people will just go along with the, with the overlays. So as with a lot of malware, one, one countermeasure we have is education, is telling people, you know, uh, warning people about these kind of scams, warning people that not everyone on the internet is nice, um, and training them to, to identify these suspicious text messages. But as I'm sure you can imagine, there's a certain number of people for which they will always fall for these kind of things, and that's why um, this kind of this kind of scam is so lucrative. Now, one other, um, one other approach, and this is something that I was working on at Netcraft, was automating, or, uh, automating the process of alerting banks when they were being targeted by Flubot. And so you can inform the banks and they can alert their customers. Um, and so this, this is quite a targeted approach. It, it means that people people are, are thinking about Flubot specifically rather than just general um, malicious text messages. Um, but again, it's not perfect. And this all boils down to this. If someone is willing to go through all of the steps to give Flubot this much power, there's not really that much you can do about it. Some apps need this kind of power. Some apps need to be able to draw things over other apps on the screen. Some, some apps do need access to the accessibility services. So you can't really turn them off, but people will just follow instructions and they will give the app this kind of power. And at that point, it's pretty much game over. And in fact, most, most consumer advice for dealing with Flubot once you've got it involves factory resetting your phone or using the Android debug, uh, debug bridge to manually remove Flubot. So, really, we just want to stop people getting it in the first place. So, thank you very much for listening. Um, if any of you are interested, I can give you these links afterwards. And uh, if there are any questions, I'll be happy to take them. <laughs>